Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our roundtable panel on the South China Sea. Uh, this is the second event in our Flashpoint series uh, organized by the Graduate Center in Governance and International Affairs, which is part of the uh, broader School of Political Science and International Studies. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Shah Hamiri, and I'm an associate professor in the school and associate director of the Graduate Center, and I'll be chairing today's panel. The Flashpoint series, just to give you some kind of an overview, is aimed um, to, uh, at applying the school's breadth and depth of expertise, which are second to none in Australia, uh, to public forums discussing issues of current importance in world affairs. The South China Sea clearly fits that bill. It is clearly a potential flashpoint of real significance for regional and global politics today. Disputes over who has sovereignty over parts or all of the South China Sea have persisted for some time between China and a number of Southeast Asian states, the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia and Brunei. More recently, however, tensions have clearly intensified. Island building activities by China and on a smaller scale, Vietnam and Philippines has been used to support territorial claims in the South China Sea, but have also raised concerns over freedom of navigation and aviation in the area, especially given evidence that China has been building military installations on some artificial islands. Alongside these developments, clashes at sea, especially involving fishing boats and coast guard vessels, have become increasingly frequent. The United States is also getting involved in the South China Sea through freedom of navigation exercises by naval vessels and military warplanes, with Australia occasionally joining in. Both the United States and China have accused each other of militarizing the South China Sea. Furthermore, I think it's fair to say that the sale of uh, the recent announcement by uh, President Obama uh, that Vietnam would be allowed to uh, purchase weapons from the United States uh, and also the return of military bases to Philippines, the American military bases to Philippines for the first time in over 20 years are, are also related to the situation in the South China Sea. And as we speak, a decision is pending by the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague on a case brought forward unilaterally by the Philippines under the United Nations Conventions of the Laws of the Sea to determine the legality of China's so-called nine-dash line claim to sovereignty over much of the South China Sea. Although China is a signatory to the convention, its government says it does not recognize the court's jurisdiction over these matters and has refused to participate in the proceedings. So clearly the situation in the South China Sea is both complex, fluid, and potentially combustible. So fear not, to resolve all these problems, to discuss these events, uh, we've assembled... Big uh, up there. <laughs> <laughs> we've assembled a terrific panel of experts from our school. Each will speak for approximately five minutes with the aim of allowing plenty of time for discussion at the end. So our first speaker, is Associate Professor Andrew Phillips. Andrew is an expert in international security and his most recent co-authored book, International Order and Diversity, published by Cambridge University Press, just won the American Political Science Association Jervis Schroeder Best Book Award. So Andrew will go first. Thank you. Our second speaker, Dr. Sarah Tate, is the Deputy Director of the Asia Pacific Center for the Responsibility to Protect in the school. She has written extensively on Chinese foreign policy and atrocity prevention, and Dr. Tate has just got back from Beijing, what, two days ago? Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> Where she has spent several months at the Chi Chinese Institute of International Studies. Last but not least is Dr. Noel Morada. Noel is Director of Regional Diplomacy and Capacity Building at the Asia Pacific Center for the Responsibility to Protect. He has extensive experience as both practitioner and researcher on Asian politics, specifically ASEAN. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over the mic to Andrew. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jaha. Those of you that know me will know that I'm a simple person. That means for me that when something looks like a dragon, behaves like a dragon, I don't need it to breathe fire on me to, before I'm going to say, that's a dragon. And China has been behaving in particularly dragon-like manner in the South China Sea. I want to briefly address three points. What is happening in the South China Sea, why it might be happening, and what we might do about it. First, um, at the certainty of um, simplifying a much more complex landscape, I would argue that what we're observing at the moment in the South China Sea is China pursuing a policy of revisionism that is episodic in its frequency, often plausibly deniable in its form through the use of vehicles such as uh, shipping fleets in order to mask certain forms of aggression, but certainly sustainable and consistent in its character. As Shaha signalled from the outset, China has had long-standing maritime claims in the South China Sea. 
to give you an indication of the strategic importance of the South China Sea, $5.3 trillion of trade passes through the South China Sea every year. This is the maritime superhighway that helps sustain Asia's uh, engagement with the rest of the world. China, in the past five years in particular, has engaged in significant activities. Shah has mentioned them. Uh, most significantly, 2,900 acres of land reclamation in contested areas in the South China Sea. Why is that important? It is important for two reasons. First, it enables China to potentially develop the military infrastructure to project military power consistently throughout the South China Sea and beyond. It enables it to consolidate control over a contested maritime periphery. But second, what it does is that it asserts a more general Chinese capacity to destabilise a regional security order that has up to this point in time been pre predicated on a US-centred system of security alliances and guarantees. Okay, why is this happening? Uh, this is where it gets interesting. Uh, I mentioned to Shahar earlier I was keen to channel my inner John Mearsheimer today. Uh, and there is certainly a very strong case for suggesting that what we're observing in the South China Sea is a consistent Chinese attempt to attack the soft underbelly of the United States security architecture within the region. That there is a consistent effort here on the part of China, as have great powers done in the past, to establish and consolidate control over its maritime periphery, an area that is of vital commercial importance, and that, if China succeeds in establishing hegemony in this area, enables it to largely insulate itself from the prospect of United States military pressure. And in doing so, China would not be Robinson Crusoe, or whatever the Mandarin equivalent of Robinson Crusoe might be. The United <laughs> States, in fact, did precisely the same kind of activities when it was consolidating control over the Caribbean in the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, this is what big powers do. If you are a dissatisfied big power that is increasing in capability, you typically try to translate those capabilities into greater claims within the international system. So that's explanation number one, that this is part of a premeditated grand Chinese plan, plan to establish uh, regional hegemony, or at the very least, to undermine United States hegemony. But there is a more interesting explanation, and um, a shout out here to my colleague and friend Shaha Hamieri, who's written, you can pay me later, a really <laughs> terrific article on this, which actually says, well, that idea of China is really, it does sort of have this sort of conceit of a, a malevolent monolith that is centrally directing affairs in a premeditated, linear fashion. And Shah actually suggests some really interesting evidence that, in fact, a lot of this could actually be driven at a provincial or sub-state mm -hmm. level by a variety of different actors. What is interesting about this argument is, first, that it is actually consistent with patterns of imperial expansion historically, where it is frequently non-state actors and the so-called pull of the periphery that creates a dynamic of expansion. The great difficulty from a prescriptive perspective, that is, what do we do about it, is that those different interpretations lend themselves to different analyses. If this is a situation in which China is engaging in a large-scale play for hegemony, then this requires a significant consolidation and deterrence uh, of the deterrence uh, architecture that exists within the region at the moment. Conversely, if this is something that is more being driven by the periphery, then that would suggest the need to engage at a multilateral level and particularly to look at the possibility of resource sharing arrangements within the region. Uh, South China Sea, incidentally, uh, estimated to contain 11 billion barrels of delicious oil and 190 trillion cubic feet of uh, LNG. So to close, the great difficulty at the moment is that it is an issue that we confront always in international politics. Increased strategic contestation, but an inherent uncertainty about the intentions of a rising revisionist actor. Calibrating the best measure of response, deterrence on the one hand versus engagement on the other, is going to be the great challenge for policymakers in the region. A challenge that is both difficult to navigate, necessary to execute, and importantly, significantly above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> Sarah. That's just saying we're probably not going to solve the issue today. What I wanted to, um, I'm, pro I'm also going to focus on China, but I wanted to first just give a little context of Andrew, Andrew alluded to what's at stake, and I, I'll give a few, um, a few comments on what's at stake as well. Um, right, there's estimates there's potentially enough oil to supply China for 60 years uh, in the South China Sea. 
So when we look at sort of the motivations behind China's engagement, we need to understand that there is a big resource drive behind it. As Andrew mentioned, there's also um, $5.3 trillion of global trade that passes through the South China Sea each year, and so we see this as a, a major strategic route, uh, economic route. Um, we also see China attempting to perhaps unsettle, challenge the U.S. alliance system in the region and U.S. reliability as a security partner in the region. And then finally, I think that outside of Chinese motivations, one of the reasons we see this as a major issue um, among other stakeholders, I often got the question while in Beijing, why is Australia evolved, involved in this? Beyond its uh, alliance with the US, why is just Australia, what stakes are at play here? And that is, I think very importantly, that international maritime law is at stake in this issue in that China is a party to the UN Convention on the Laws of the Sea and has contested its jurisdiction over this conflict over these disputed territories and has said that it will not be will not participate in the process and will not be bound by its proceedings. And so we see an, in combination of a lot of strategic interests involved, there is another side at play of how can how can we understand China's engagement enmeshment in international law? And then I think the broader question of that is what sort of power will China be? And so we look at both what is contextually happening right now, but also the way in which China is contesting, uh, is claim making claims on the South China Sea and contesting our international jurisdictions uh, over the disputes is a broader question on, as China rises, what is the impact on, the, on international order? How do we see uh, China interacting with its neighbors and where do we see it's um, pushing the boundaries of what's acceptable in the region. And one of the things that, um, the way that we look back and say, how did this start and where did we, how did we get to where we are today? We look back and say that part of this, the, the tensions really arose in 2008, going into 2009. And this was a point at which countries were um, putting in their claims to the UN Convention on the Laws of the Sea of the 200 nautical miles of the exclusive economic zones. And when China put in its claims, China's claims looked like it was, instead of um, the accepted territory that the UN had said, China pretty much, it calls the nine-dash line, which is basically the entire South China Sea region. Since then, uh, what China has done to assert these claims, as Andrew said, was to build, fully build territory, build islands in the South China Sea. But it also has done this through what experts call the salami slicing strategy. And this is an idea that small, persistent, um, small aggressive and persistently aggressive measures at a very little, low, uh, low level over time build up to mean a grand strategy of change. And that is the idea that um, individually, none of these singular slices of a salami uh, look like an aggressive or bell bellicose tendency, but over time we build up to a new strategy. And so that's why I, I put this in the context of saying that the, the questions that arise here are, what sort of power is this? And what are the intentions behind this? Um, now, in, I also want to just go a little bit of having talked with a lot of Chinese experts over the last few months of understanding some of the motivations beyond economy and beyond geostrategy that, um, that, that inform how Chinese experts talk about this issue. And one of them is thinking about the rise um, or resurgence of Chinese thinking of national humiliation. And this has been particularly in the Xi Jinping era of this idea of an aggrieved nation reclaiming its rightful place in the world. And to the point where Xi Jinping, the president of China, has said that not a single part of, uh, in, not a single inch of Chinese territory will be ceded. And part of this goes back to this idea that in the 90s and 2000s, China resolved 14, it has 14 uh, borders with 14 nations and it resolved many of its territorial disputes in the 90s and going back further, but it's, it's resolved disputes with Russia, with India, 
having made a lot of concessions. And the idea that uh, when China was a weaker country, that it knew that it, for its own interests, that it had to make a lot of territorial concessions in order um, to focus on its own economic development. And the idea now is that China is not going to make concessions. It has claimed a rightful st status as an emerging power, a re-emergent re power. And the concessions that it would have made previously are not the same sort of concessions it's going to make now. The, pre the concessions that it would make to Russia or to India are not the same concessions that it's going to make to Vietnam or the Philippines. And so there's an idea of the status of China that, that is partly wrapped up in these, these claims. There's also um, this idea that, um, that China is acting um, in a counter-containment strategy. Long held in Chinese thinking is that the US has pursued a policy of containment of China and that what we see is an attempt to work through international law, so liberal norms and li of the liberal order, to contain China in ways that, are, um, that aren't openly confrontational but nevertheless pursue that agenda through other means. And so this is, these are part of the concerns that Chinese analysts raise. Now, on another side, I mean, more critical or more um, people who, who kind of try to explain it in other terms say that when we look at the overall um, environment, security environment in China right now, what we had last year is a major reform process announced for the Chinese military. We saw uh, Xi Jinping announcing that 30,000 troops would be cut and that there was an overall change in China's um, military zones and the way in which it will deploy its military troops. And so part of some more critical scholars will say that we see the South China Sea as almost a legitimate legitimating narrative for understanding these reforms and selling these reforms um, and that we have on one side the idea that if that China is building up this great maritime power and that these allow both for an idea of why to focus on the building up maritime power but also saying that in the process of reform um, that the necessary cuts to the military in terms of personnel and changing that to uh, the increase in budget. So how do we justify 30,000 people being cut? Part of that is saying that we need a new strategy for a new era of risk. Um, then finally, I just kind of ending probably on where do I see restraints? Um, where do we see the potential for um, pressure points for China, for example. Um, one is that China had announced its major strategic, and people call this perhaps the, the new grand strategy of China, is the One Belt, One Road initiative mm -hmm. and the Maritime Silk Road initiative. And this is essentially along the old route to the Silk Road, um, linking China to the Middle East or to the Eurasia region, that at along a land route and also along a maritime route. And one of the elements of restraint is this idea that this overarching grand strategy, which is in, in sort of Xi Jinping's uh, legitimacy narrative is much more important than individual disputes over the South China Sea. And there are recent talks that perhaps disputes over the South China Sea are souring relations with ASEAN to the extent that the maritime um, bell to the maritime route for this, uh, the new Silk Road maritime route would be, uh, have, it would be difficult to implement this without improving relationships in, uh, with Southeast Asian partners. Then also, uh, I think that we've seen that every time China sort of gets to the brink of confrontation with the U.S., it really pulls back. And I do mm. believe that there is an idea that it can only push so far before uh, China's re reclamations or military engagement in the region will really cre uh, create confrontation with the US. And 
China has put forward the idea of a new great power relations, which is specifically trying to counter this idea that as an emerging power rises, the existing or waning power that they would they would enter into conflict. And so I think that those two sort of measures of constraint might be uh, areas where we can think about potentially movements in which China, we can see backing away from the brink. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Sarah. Well, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I think what I'm going to do is present a perspective from the claimant states of ASEAN on the South China Sea. And just a little background that uh, following the end of the Cold War, there was an effort on the part of ASEAN uh, to engage China you know, in terms of what they call socializing China into the norms of ASEAN, particularly promoting you know, uh, peaceful dialogue on many issues related to South China Sea. So the first effort, effort on the part of ASEAN was to have the Manila Declaration in 1992. And then this was the time when the US bases were you know, closed in the Philippines. And so there was a lot of fear in the region that you know, without the US bases in the Philippines, how are we going to deal with the rise of China? And then in 1994, you have the creation of the ASEAN Regional Forum, which actually started the process of engaging what they call non-traditional partners in the region. Then suddenly in 1995, that's the first problem related to China's uh, engagement in South China Sea. The mischief reef, the name itself, <laughs> is quite significant. So following the mischief reef uh, incident, I think the, the problem that it presented to the Philippines is that, OK, we don't have the American basis now who is going to help us in dealing with this uh, particular issue. Initially, the Philippines wanted support from ASEAN in engaging China on this. Uh, there's a lot of interpretation that you know, the, the leadership in Beijing didn't really know how mischief reef came about. And so from the initial attempt to engage ASEAN involvement in this uh, mischief reef incident, the Philippines decided to just you know, take it as it is and then work towards a bilateral uh, negotiation with China. And then uh, what is so significant about the mid-1990s until uh, maybe early 2000 is that uh, there's a perspective within ASEAN that you know, we should not continue to push for a multilateral approach in dealing with the South China Sea because China is against internationalizing the issue. So the strategy of China compared to the Philippines, for example, is that China wants to limit you know, the settlement of the dispute on a bilateral, you know, level. But uh, the Philippines has been pushing for a regional as well as international approach. Now, 2002 was the year when you have the DOC, the Declaration of uh, uh, Conduct among claimant states. Now, this is a non-binding declaration, and they're still working on a more binding code of conduct. But what is significant about this is that it is part of what you call confidence building measure between you know, the claimant states of ASEAN and uh, you know, China. It's been going on. But on the other hand, China wanted to use this as a way of promoting itself as using soft power diplomacy. It was also in the early 2000s that China and Vietnam were able to negotiate a very good uh, border treaty both land and uh, maritime in the Gulf of Tonkin. Okay. So, and then a royal administration came in in 2003. Uh, they wanted to really focus on economic relations with China. But then when Aquino took over in 2010, the controversy has to do with so many economic projects in the Philippines supported by China were tainted with corruption. And so that started the souring of relations between China and the Philippines. And what triggered this primarily was early on in the term of Aquino, there were Chinese tourists who were killed in Manila. And Aquino refused to apologize because of the botch uh, rescue operation. And then in 2012, the Scarborough Shoal, uh, which is closer to the Philippines, uh, many Filipino fishermen were not allowed by Chinese uh, who occupied Scarborough Shoal. So what happened since then is that uh, 
this uh, tension between China and the Philippines resulted in the Philippines filing a case uh, in the permanent uh, tribunal, arbitral tribunal. And of course, China was pissed off. And then the Philippines uh, suddenly thought of, okay, let's negotiate with the, U with the U.S. for this EDCA, the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement. Uh, under EDCA, you have five military bases that will be set up in the Philippines. And one of them is in Palawan facing the South China Sea. So the problem here is that uh, there is quite a concern that when you have the U.S. being involved directly in the South China Sea, it will continue to escalate the conflict. Indirectly, Japan is also involved because Japan has been providing uh, Coast Guard uh, ships to the Philippines and Vietnam. And from the Philippines and Vietnam perspective, whatever is happening in the dispute, maritime dispute in the north is a, somehow a gauge of how much China is actually going to behave in the South China Sea. So I think we're waiting for the result of the tribunal decision by end of June, and we don't know uh, to what extent uh, China will you know, continue to have this reclamation uh, project in South China Sea. There are some people in the Philippines who are really going to look at whether the U.S. will be able to protect under the Mutual Defense Treaty uh, if China will start reclamation project on Scarborough Shoal, which is within the 200 economic, uh, exclusive economic zone of the Philippines, whether the U.S. will defend the Philippines in that regard. So I think from a perspective of you know, ASEAN and the Philippines in particular, there's so much that will be at stake uh, you know, in the next few months. Now, we just had an election in the Philippines uh, this year, and the new president-elect said that he is open to direct bilateral negotiations with China because the bilateral negotiations have been stopped under Aquino administration. So we don't know yet to what extent that will improve the relationship. But my sense is that there's not going to be a significant change because uh, the ASEAN countries, whether they are claimants or not, are actually concerned about the aggressive behavior of China. The other perspective I'd like to point out here about the issue is not just about oil and you know, the other you know, strategic relevance of South China Sea for China, but also the environmental uh, aspect of the, the conflict. Uh, the coral reefs in the South China Sea uh, is very important to many, many countries uh, in Southeast Asia. Also fisheries. Uh, we know and heard of the news that China has been going to South Africa, Argentina, and then Indonesia has been very aggressive in uh, you know, trying to shoot many of the Chinese boats in, in Indonesia. So these things are actually also uh, related to access to fishery res fish, fish resources in uh, the region. So on that note, I think I'll just leave it there and entertain some more questions. Thank you, Noah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>